Ahoy, hola, bonjour, hello, watchers of the world. Right now, it's August, it's Edinburgh, it's Glasgow, it's Scotland, it's wherever you are. I'm Michael Peterson and I'm here to introduce this Noiriki 220 BBC Words First event. Tonight's word slingers were selected from a fierce competition of applicants from all over these lands. They've workshopped, they've written, they've spoken, they've filmed. And now, here is their final works in one full, throttle, sumptuous showcase. 14 writers, 14 spoken word pieces, a journey through cultures, continents, consonants, time zones and the poetic realms beyond. We were blown away. I'm sure you will be too. Enjoy all the flavours of this freshly made word casserole. The most unforgettable thing about the house we first stayed in were the pink flowers that fell from the vine curling around this tree. I always thought then that my world would be the biggest circle that I could draw centred around this tree. But times were tough and the journey to stability slippery, moving between one house and the next we were but a tiny ship, trying to find our bearings in the stormy ocean even as we lost one of our own to the currents. I learned that I didn't have to travel far to feel uprooted. At 18, I left our ship and ran across oceans to this island. A well-known condition of migration into the United Kingdom for work, refuge or an education from a nation once tied to this land by the threads of imperial domination is that one must learn and never forget that this country is not your home. This country cannot be your home. Here you exist in the grey zone, for if you don't return, you are a greedy traitor, but if you choose to stay, you are a thief, an invader, an illusion of a citizen given permission to breathe by a point space system. But loneliness is a ghost unstopped by borders, and I learned that to survive, attachment is an option to be pursued at my own risk. So I let my anchor drop at the city of Den Aiden, here I learned the difference between raindrops of the Indian monsoons and Scottish precipitation as I battled tentacles of depression shielded in the arms of a person. I learned how to decorate myself with labels that tore me apart based on the color of my skin. I listened to the stories of other wayfarers searching for belonging while drinking feelings of deep longing until the grains of sand in the hourglass ran out. You see, I still don't know where home is or where home is meant to be. All I know is home is not the place you stay, it's not the place you're from, it's not the place you belong. Home are all the places you choose to let torment you by cutting, splitting and slicing you apart only so these places can rebuild you, this time with a shred of each and every one of them stitched onto your skin. And the day I turn weary, I will open my battered case and pour from it pieces of cities and shards of streets bearing my footprints along with what is left of me into a small square of the earth. Then I will have nowhere left to go, and there I will watch my home grow. On the black mantle sits profound frames wrapped around severed scenes. Smiles lacking names or joy or a moment's rest are stuck in a still of bliss, later to be wrung out by tired eyes. The mirror that hangs above magnifies the deep creases in my brow and brings attention to the grit that sits in the recesses of my sorry grin. I begin to pick, 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 trying to make it better, but there's only so many times you can look your reflection in the eyes before it stops looking back. Pick, pick, pick. Crooked nails cling for their life on half-eaten walls, coated in a putrid green, weeping cracks begging to be plastered back together. We long to be mended. This house gave up standing tall years ago. Soggy fag butts on my favourite coffee cup littered on the living room floor. 
white ceramic, now turned grey, grotty graveyard of stress and temper. This is a minuscule piece to a bigger bombsite of a puzzle that's left my house in a fucking tip. Pick, 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 pick. Unknown fluid seeped into the fibres of the carpet, leaving obnoxious reminders of exchanged bacteria, wasted hours and repurposing furniture. The pungent scent that dwells in the halls and spaces lurks around my nostrils. Stale tobacco, various body odours callously deriding my palate, leaving bitter parcels on unwelcome buds. Pick, 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 pick. I want to leave but never make it to the door because it's easier to grieve than look for more. Every day feels like winter when the blinds are closed. Crumpled in a heap, I crawl back into crocodile dreams, buried in an amalgam of loose socks and unwashed linen. I escape the fog of now and hope that the crimson, the blue, the black, the brown have already had their days. When are we supposed to grow up? Did I miss the memo or will adulthood just show up out of the blue and then I'll know what to do? Because apparently I've been an adult for seven whole years and that has given me the absolute fear because I still eat Cocoa Pops for breakfast or Lidl's own brand if it's the week before payday and I feel extremely uncomfortable when a child refers to me as that lady. I hate talking on the phone. I convince myself that ghosts are real when I'm left home alone. I set up an ISA, but I don't know what that stands for. Yes, I watch the news, but I'm still not sure what our politicians actually stand for. My idea of hell is going the weekly shop for more than one person. I said I'd do it back in 2013, but I still haven't sat a single driving lesson because I'm a professional procrastinator. I always say I'll do it later. I've never bled a radiator. I bite my nails when I get stressed. Some days I don't get dressed out of my pyjamas at all. My weekends revolve around alcohol, not wine though, unless it's Echo Falls. I take three sugars in my tea. Unless someone else asks and I say, just milk please. I don't know my credit score, but if it's bad, ASOS has a lot to answer for. I recently found out the price of blinds and oh my god, it blew my mind. It all just seems so stressful and honestly I don't think I'd be very successful. Because I still long for the days when things were less complicated. Before the price of Freddo's and Capri Suns inflated. When my main concern was not being nominated to read out loud in class. And I miss the struggle of only trying to juggle school and homework and seeing my mates because now I realise the absolute state of the world. But I wished my childhood away. I don't remember the last time I went outside to play. It all just happened so fast. And then my teenage years, they passed in a flash. I just wanted to grow up so I could earn my own cash and stay up late and get any pubs and go on dates and fall in love and say the word fuck. Well, I guess I'm in luck because all of a sudden I'm 25. But what a time to be alive. Because I can eat Cocoa Pops for breakfast every single day and there's nothing anyone can say because I'm a fucking adult. Teenage boys with spinning heads from unfiltered cigarettes just want to have their moment to see their name in lights. They want to get it all, whatever you're selling and all that comes with it, however they want it and however they like it. They want to sit at the back of the bus all full of vinegar and full of lust and get all the boys and all the girls and see all the faces and all the world. They want to stand outside smoking cowboy fags like big boy lads and say things like fuck and shit and cunt and slag. They want to make sure that everyone knows who's boss as they kiss and they cross along the dance floor to the beat of their own rhythm with their brass necks and their fast steps to always get ahead. One move in front prepared to kick and crack and smash and punch their way to the top of the pile, to the top of the food chain where they will eat like kings and they'll be whoever they want to be. 
and they'll do whatever they want to do, just like their dad, and just like their uncle, just like the lad next to them at the toilet urinal, shaking his big manly hood dry, they will feel invincible. Just like they should have done from the get-go, they'll be one stamp closer to being just like the buff guys they watch on their tiny handheld screens with the 10 inch dicks that fuck the gag and busty chick with the huge massive perky tits and they call her things like slut and slag and whore and bitch cause they've been watching that shit before they were fit to realise that it's not the way that it goes not every hole is a goal that's your sister, your daughter, your mother, your lover getting groped in the middle of the dance floor but it's all that they've ever known that their masculinity is a weapon not only for show they're ready to pull the trigger and shoot their load cause it's what they are told the basic message of online pornography is that the man always wins and they got brought up to never give up, they're champions at heart, just like their dad and his before him, they always play to win, with ruffled collars on silky skin, they are the cowboys of the night. Stealing from the rich to give to the poor, they are always making sure that they are at the front of the queue, getting cash in hand as they watch the night slip away through their fingers like grains of sand and guided by the moon and the mist of the shadows, luck is always on their side as they set off into the sunset leaving behind all the mess and all the wreckage that they made along the way, all the hearts that they left shattered, all the faces that they turned blue and all the dust that they created, if only their mothers knew what they were up to. Everything is covered in blood. Drip, drip, gush. Little rose petals traced the way from bed to bathroom, and the toilet bowl is a spluttering mess, just like my head. Although, that seems to be floating on through. Every pad I put on is put in the bin, tip to tip, wing to wing, soaking wet, a bloody mess, a bloody Mary might sort it out. Vodka, pickled onion, cucumber, salt and pepper, tomato, tomata, how am I still bleeding? How is there even any blood left in me for it to be pouring down my leg like a spilt drink? Everything is covered in blood. Gush. My trousers are soaked. I should really keep note of all the pants I've destroyed with this eternal bleeding, this infernal bleeding, continuous gush, this drip drip, bloody thighs and doctors we trust. I don't want to go back in there. To where? My bairn was cremated and scattered on the hospital rose beds. To there? Where? They woke me in the night, my dad's bam haze. It felt really tight and I screamed in the pains of not just physical memories of forced entries and fear. To there, where, I told them before and I told them again, just like I told him and it wasn't passed on. Say it once, say it twice and still be ignored, disregarded and left in a muss, in a puddle of blood. Gosh. Some are fathers, some are fucked, some are happy, some get hurt Some have children getting married, some have run fresh out of luck Some have everything planned out, some will ever live devoted to the crushing sense of doubt That they've only just afforded and these children getting married They are only getting started, their decline is systematic The worries in the attic, cause the life they love is real There's no better way to feel that everything's in their control to pits and smiles Take their toes and fill their faces With distraction, self and non-reality But you're never safe and sound When you're lying through your teeth About the truth that you can't run from It's banging on the window While you tell yourself it's fine This happens all the time Some are sighing in the shower Only place that you can cower Now it's time to meet the day And after sleeping with the lights on Doesn't matter either way if you're really there at all And you're not allowed to say that you're not coping with it all And life flies by in the twinkle of an eye So hurry me, hurry me And make me think of something better And you're not allowed 
to see that you're not coping with it all And there's nothing you can do But accept this fucking hell No, you're not feeling very well The name Feather Though said to have become popular in post-independent days Still sears through the page with its depth and richness in history Feather they say it could be translated as Phoebe in Greek, a goddess of oracle and prophecy, but the layers of meaning unfold pristine when seen from the names Macaulay. Letter Celasse, Celasse the Celeste, Celeste meaning three. Molokotom had a triad as the forces that be. One with the air and the earth beneath my feet, formulating base rooted in the family tree. I trace Kemelu's La'al in the extension of every branch, from the innermost phloem to the outer strips of bark, connecting each facet to the sum of its parts, Feven, meaning messenger, a conduit in projecting speech, but Tarih seen as divinity, helping Apostle Paulos profess what he needs to preach. Found in the books, that make up Roman 16, Philip, born to a lineage of healers and radiant queens, Almas, Negaset, Negasti, Abrahat, Tabera, Zodi, Lula, Itai, Brahano, Gergis, Dimmit, the Gummit in her head, Nabuholi, Fulut, is in Adetat, Zugabara, Wards, Orot, Nemeret, the Ankit, Kit who loved us, their children, no matter what it took. Our mothers of mothers, at times needing to survive on Tsebel Sit, finding dignity within, despite conditions being squalid, demen nutsuh liben The seeds finally reaped a culmination of their dreams, the final form taken, woven into the prayers they speak, whispered silently into waters so their tears are not seen. Udase Mariam in the morning, Melahla before they sleep. So, I say their names, as they did for me too, like a mantra that's exuding my truth. I say their names, and I say their Adli too, till I make sure that they are repeated in my history books. Right, here is a childhood story and it's called Faithless. I was told by the people I respected the most that the devil is always watching me, waiting to lure me in if I watch that film or listen to that music or look at that girl. I've got to cut my eye out because Armageddon's coming any minute now and it risks too much to doubt. Oh, but at 17 I did it, I doubted. I found out all the secrets. Nothing was what it seems. I was a hardcore preacher kid turned atheist and I wished a loving artist was behind it all but I felt emptiness. Disillusion. The force of good felt like a dead carcass. See, I was told everything would be perfect and I believed it. And now nothing is. I can't handle it. Grieving paradise. Another truth means panic. Shatters me. Paralyzing spasms. An emergency it felt. Everything was out to hurt me. I ached for the world I love. But took no comfort. Because it could get corrupt. See, got to keep my guard up. Because that day hurt. And how can I believe in love? When most family and old friends feel gone, they're not allowed to talk to me. So you put a war in me, and now I left the light as if it's heavy. No trust in myself, to follow my will met the voice of a gut smothered by sly and sweet scriptures, instinct resisted. So used to authority imposed, sucking on drip-fed words of hope and control, but now I am godless, there's no hand to hold, what way do I go? I still feel that Satan is behind it all, you know. But not every fault is the devil's grip on me. My old faith still feels like home. You're in my roots, but you're not in the ending. You swore paradise was only felt in your grip, but you were never heaven. 
And when I found out that I don't have to listen to the old men on the platform, I could feel history tingle, life pulsing back into the world that was before called Satan's evil system. I still oppress myself though. It shows I'm conscious. See, I think to let control go as weak and ignores as if truth's only true if it cuts me to my core. But the devil, the devil's not here anymore. And the way out's inside me, apparently, so let me leave a thought if it's petty and find my own remedies. Because though all has fallen, well, it's still faith that will save me. My laptop is overheating with anxiety, knees shaking up, down, left, right with extreme variety. I just wish I could sit tight and concentrate. Five minutes till applications close and I'm still debating where to place the comma before or after the but. But I've got this nagging inkling to give up. There's no point. You'll never get this job after the 18th redraft of my application. I submit. Three long weeks later and I finally have news. Booked in for an interview with three weeks to wait. Provides a little time to escape of how they perceive my overly enthusiastic emails. Buzzing about what a career map future entails. Skipping over the cracks of a shattered welfare state. No time to hesitate, as failing to prepare is preparing to fail. Every time I open my laptop, I sit and stare at the company's code of conduct while simultaneously preparing my specialist subject on mastermind being. Come down with me, best bits, seasons one to six. I awake on interview day, all sticky-eyed and grumpy, no sleep last night to be expected, a mixture of nerves and excitement. Lumping lumps of lumpy porridge into my mouth, I'll do anything to power this brain adequately. Let's seize this opportunity. Shirt and tie with no trousers on, I take one last look at the code of conduct before accepting the Zoom call. Grinding on my enamel as I smile with authority, hoping my obscure knowledge will stand out as an anomaly to the two white middle-aged people whose judgement is prophecy. The call ends and I jump out of my seat after the tenth bead of sweat splats onto my knee. I gleam from cheek to cheek, the nerves are now at ease, relieved. I exhale, thank fuck that is over. I take off my shirt and tie and dance with confidence. It's been three weeks and the initial adrenaline of excitement has been replaced with prolonging and patience of confinement to a waste of a life. With no career in mind, I'm an overthinking nuclear power station. From behind my control room, my reactor has hut a meltdown, with the only message in my outlook being from a Nigerian prince looking to steal my identity. The next day I awake to news, my pupils excitedly dilate, I quickly scan the email to find my fate, control finding no success, I wish this could be up for debate. A solemn line of, I'm sorry to inform you, feeds back the many regrets I had when interview day tore up my future prosperity. With only me to blame, I'm linking in to the job search again. My father named me blindness. He named me after a sheep that will follow the shepherd, that will never question the words of a man. He named me after the house of David. He thought this would keep me safe. It would keep me safe to blindly follow them. My mother knew better. She named me after vigilance, after a watchful eye to never trust the words of men, to always ask the shepherd why. She knew this would keep me safe. My father again named me, a name meaning noble birth, giving me a hill to stand on and defend with my life. And I would for a time. But what they did not know is that in my head there was a name calling me. A new name. A name I had never heard but somehow I understood. It was cold. It was harsh. It was a shield that I used to protect myself from years of not understanding why they would name me for a lamb. I was clearly a lion, a demon with claws, a viper in the grass. I was born under a hunter's sky, so I could not understand why they had done this to me. Why they had named me for a lamb. So, I ran to the coldest forest I knew, and I hid inside the tallest evergreen. 
I was the guardian of the frozen forest. The dead forest, and that is who I will be. But as season changed, so do we. I realised I was not this frozen forest. I was something much worse. You see, my father had named me after the house of David. A king of all men. But I began to realise I was born on the land scorched in David's name. I was no longer a precious member of his flock. I was an eldest born sacrifice ready to be made. I know who I am. I named myself after the king they strung up in the trees. I remade myself in the image of the dead king. Of a forest lost to fire and lamb's blood. At night I wonder what the trees must think of me. What my father thinks of me. And what my mother already knows. I am a heretic. I am evil. I honour the dead of the trees. And I named myself a hero. We now go to Stuart, sitting in his notepad, struggling to write, squinting at half-formed phone notes he wrote in the night. And then if we establish that his poetry shite, we'll go to something more important, like the weather. Look, come on, man, he's a chance to blether. I bring my bunny rabbits a stick of hay each day after breakfast, because I know that it'll make them love me slightly more, and that love means so much coming from something so pure. And now for the wet- No, no, come on, this is inhumane. Do not cut me away just because you have decided what I have to say is unimportant. I can I don't leave this place without wondering what those bunny rabbits are up to because I know that they at least do not have any prejudice or selfishness, they are just they and that cannot be blown, it does not burn, it cannot be buried or lost in the snow, no do not go to the weather just yet, do not end the break, I do, I swear I do have a point to make, I went, a right to try and bring joy in a world where there is not enough of that and so much of so much else, so much fog blocking the view of the wildfire spread by the wind, stuck by the stuffy, steamy self-obsession we pull from the well. I know too well one minuscule moment can make a day or make it hell. In early hours I worry I've spoiled too many and not made enough. Do not go to the weather just yet. Why do we just have to be okay with staying afloat? Does anyone even remember when we got into these boats? I'm trying to stop mine from capsizing. Google says bunny rabbits can swim but mine have such cute weak little arms they never try. Why should they have to swim to survive? These waves are, waves are breaking and so is the boat. It feels like things are getting worse. I've called the coast guard but they won't come. Said they don't have the purse. Fun because from the boats doing fine more stable than mine I can hear the fishermen talking about their net worth. Do not cut me off for the weather just yet, please. Do not cut me off for an advert about which lawyer to contact when I get divorced from the wife I'm yet to meet. Or a government broadcast about how to claim unemployment pay for a job I'm yet to lose but you're forecasting I will do in 2022. If I can break water I can break these radio waves too. Do not go to the weather just yet. It is important to try and be good. It is the most important thing. Do not go to the weather just yet. When I am with those bunny rabbits, I am able to forget that there is bad in this world and that I am arms flailingly unable to stop any of it. But my bunnies flop on the carpet and lie like Superman on the floor or put their hands under my hand to be stroked. I want to work through the weather but for now I bring my bunny rabbits a stick of hay each day after breakfast because I know that it will make them love me slightly more and that love means so much coming from something so pure. If you must go to the weather, wait for me. We'll present it together. Let me name the storms and move the green screen map. Decide what to project until the east coast and the west to wear a coat today but no it doesn't mean you'll be wet forever i will write again i just need to rest i will write again i'm trying my best i will write again just please do not go to the weather just yet harvest so what will we do for a forgotten crop of boys swinging for Scotland's trees, a flock of strangled gasps, ringtones bleating at their tunes, becoming missed calls, text chime, Mike, where are you? Jim, I'm starting to get worried now. Gonna answer? Thatcher cleared your fathers out the factories and knew your sons hang for their structures. Rivers swollen for the bulk of fleshy pebbles. Boys trying to disappear into an intimate, stoned darkness. So what will we do? For the tick, 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 ticking of unpaid tick bills. Can I just blame it on the gear, the fear of the pills? For some boys, the dawn just seems to sear a little more vicious. 
holding on to health like it was an icy dripping in June. Then it's the shimmering sing of silver on bone as trains get cancelled, commuters tut and curse, choking to get home. And Facebook is a graveyard. Statuses flash their epitaphs. Can I believe that's big decky past? Sleep tight, my man. Gone, but not forgotten. And menches that lie in jotters and on walls are like the scribbled doon screams for the other side. So, what will we do for the daddyless? Boys scared of attraction, eyes fixed to a point in the changing rooms, rejecting erections, rejected by family, ejected into early heavens. For the black boys, for the brun boys, for the trans boys, for our little forever boys, joining the nameless plague. For the mammies, blowing incantations into strong tea by the TV's blue light. The absence of smoke, the fuller fridge. They dine in for two, they're awfully big, ain't they? I wouldn't know him. I can't eat. Toxic masculinity has went and gone caustic. Fizzing corrosive on the soul. The only harvest to speak of this year is loss. As boys blink out like the lights in a tenement windy. So... What will we do? I hold the photograph in my hand, tracing my painted fingernails over the image of a young man. He strikes a pose, standing tall and proud on the low-hanging branch of a tree, exuding a strength I did not expect to see. A man I do not know, for I met him only after years of turning lathes had aged the discs of his spine and turned him into a smaller version of himself. I wonder if that tree is close to Mbala Road, a place I've searched for on Google Maps more times than I care to admit as I toggle through Street View searching for a clue, something, anything to find the trace of a young man 22. 3,374 miles. That is the journey she travelled alone, but for an infant. By rail, by foot, by boat, after standing guard when they drew a line that cut a country in two to meet a husband she barely knew by a tree in a new world. A promise of work, a better future, opportunities growing like fruit from a tree near Mbala Road. Opportunities my mother never had when they showered those golden walls with bullets and uprooted her life plans. When I was wee, she worked so hard to put words in my mouth, to teach my tongue to be like hers, folding words into Akta so that she could nourish me with my ma bully. But all I yearned to do was to find my voice in the throat of my coloniser, too ashamed of my mother's tongue that I let her think I despised her, too busy cutting off branches to realise that those roots were buried deep in the earth and they just kept growing back. I was 22 and all I could do was fight with her about bringing me up stuck between two worlds, two parallel worlds that could just never meet. She was 22 and her fate was sealed, two letters and a marriage to a stranger. A stranger who grew up in the city of Discovery because his maternal line traced a journey of Duke by rail, by foot, by boat to a place that felt familiar. A stranger whose father found a tree in Dundee that reminded him of Nairobi. Two worlds, two parallel worlds, meeting in the right place, tied by twine to a tree. Hanji, Naiji, Geshji, Noji. Entire relationships that could not stretch beyond two syllables to uncover buried roots until it was too late. And stories of a young man posing on the low-hanging branch of a tree near Mbala Road turned to ashes. The one who outcounts. Geese fly above me, V-shaped gravity pulling them into formation, each one flying in their place. Geese fly south in the coldest steps of winter light guides them. As they traverse across the globe, they see the world in ways humans cannot gaggle together. Don't. But what of the goose straggling behind? 
the one who outcounts the V-shaped form, the one who never honks loudly but has so much to say, the one who took too long to fly the nest. What of the straggler? The one who doesn't want to fly south, to fly north, to fly south, over your mountains, atop your waves, across your burning plains, back and forth each season, forced to follow and never allowed to question nature. What of his desires? To fly east, to fly west, to rest, to burn the compass and instead fly crop circles into a slipstream that jettisons him toward a nothingness. Avoid where he will make up for lost time. Avoid where he can get lost in. Give in to his desires. Geese fly above me. As muscle memory escapes my wings as I forget how to fly, even as winter rolls in deep, as coldness fills my gullet, and I drown in my own gaggle. No more, please. Today? Today, I will fly east toward the rising sun, toward its fiery oranges letting red wash over me, consuming me in its angry embers, inflaming my soul until the pain becomes beautiful. As I fly toward the place where all begin to burn the world down. So that's us. You've just heard a show reel of 14 of the BBC World's first finalists who we've been working with over the past month with digital workshops featuring tutors such as Colin McGuire, Leila Josephine, Kat Hepburn, and Hannah Lavery. We've all had the pleasure and privilege of working with these young aspiring writers who are all producing fantastic stuff and we've got our fingers crossed high hopes for some of these writers to break through on the bigger and better things but in the meantime just like to thank them all for taking part in this program it's been a pleasure and privilege working with them and to thank all our tutors bbc words first we've been noiriki and hopefully we'll be seeing you live one day soon